Four whole minutes? I'm impressed. Hey, good morning, Maureen. Good morning. Yes, sir. Well, he was supposed to be out of town, and Diane was supposed to preach, but Diane caught she, she got COVID. Run, run, run. Good morning. I'm doing well, you. Good to see you. Well, I don't know. Well, I was trying to get the mask so I could get it on and off. I think that's going to do it. If I can get this on top of the wires. <laughs> that way I can get it on. Yeah, okay. Well, fortunately, I'll have the mask off most of the time because I'll be doing my part and the pastor's part and Diane's part. <laughs>
Thank you for that. I love that stuff. Uh, good morning and welcome to the Church of the Good Shepherd. This is the day that the Lord has made. Rejoice. Let us and rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, on my way to church this morning, I was thinking about what an honor and a privilege it is to set the table for my good friend Mike Buford. Uh, you may notice that he is not Diane Lowry. Uh, Diane uh, has been affected with COVID. She is home. Uh, she will appreciate your cards and letters, uh, but let's not ring her phone off the hook and uh, give her time to get well. Uh, the pastor is also quarantining at this time, and uh, so we hope everybody's staying safe. You may also notice that we put our masks back on. Uh, I took mine off to talk to you, but you'll be glad to know that I'll put it back on when I sing. And uh, we uh, want to welcome uh, any guests that we have. Do we have any guests today over here on this side? I think I recognize all y'all. How about over here? In the middle? All repeat offenders. Good. Um, I also thought this morning about Lenny Harris. Does anybody know who Lenny Harris is? Any baseball fans? He yep. started his, uh, you, you might know. Yeah. Uh, he started his career with the Reds. He finished it with the Marlins. Uh, he holds the distinction of the most pinch hits in the history of the major leagues. And I thought of this only because we got one of the best pinch hitters right here today. <laughs> and I will enjoy his, his uh, message. Um, Birthdays this week. I know it's Gailey's birthday today. There's much fanfare made about that uh, with the youth on their trip. Called her up in the middle of the night to wish her happy birthday. Uh, also on the third, Helen Porter. On the fifth, Melania Curry. Also on the fifth, Beth Wilt. On the sixth, Jenny Kopp. And on the eighth, Don Waterbury. And it's a busy week in my family. Today is also my Uncle Larry's birthday who is worshiping right now at South Newport Baptist Church in Eulonia, Georgia. Also his son, Wade, who was born on his birthday. And uh, tomorrow would have been my grandmother's 107th. And then my mom's is the day after that. So uh, obviously a lot, lot going on with the Leos and my family. And we wish everybody happy birthdays this week. Um, we'll do most of our announcements later. There are some announcements in the bulletin, but you may want to think about what's going on and whether those things are actually happening. Diane asked me to mention specifically that the adult games uh, event that they have been uh, talking about is not going to happen. That's postponed until further notice. And so, you know, check around, ask around, see what's going on. Uh, but obviously we are uh, taking more precautions now uh, for everyone's health. Um, Let's see. I think that was most of it. Um, think I missed anything? I think you got it all. Okay. Then how about we uh, recite together the Apostles' Creed? <clears throat> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Evangelho. The entering confession. Let us confess our sin together, for we have all fallen short of the glory of God. Sisters and brothers in Christ, the promise of our faith is that whoever turns to Jesus Christ will never hunger for forgiveness, and that which gives life to the world, that is the promise of joy and peace. and praise for the following prayers. Kathy McAndrew recovering from her cancer surgery at Life Care Center of Melbourne. There is limited visitation. Andy Consenza, kidney stones. Kevin Burke fell at uh, home on July 25th. Judy Lustig, Barbara Bailey's sister, uh, passed away on the 24th. Fred Platt, friend of Ray Lynch, is on a respirator. He has COVID at Kindred Hospital. Wayne Sanderson sends AFib with his heart. There are five firefighters that we know of that have COVID. Uh, Natalie Jones, Cancer, Melbourne Regional Medical Center on hospice care. Gwen Sears, Joetta Wilcox's sisters in rehab. Arlene Barstow, Grand Villa, failing eyesight. Gina Lembrezzi, Diane Randolph's daughter, and uh, she's battling Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Pat Hines' brother for internal bleeding. Brenda Fortin's brother, Rocco, who has been diagnosed with lymphoma. Kenneth Waterbury, uh, Don Waterbury's son, had surgery on July 13th for colon cancer. It is determined to be stage three, and, she's, and he's on chemo and radiation. Uh, continued prayers for those recovering from surgeries and procedures. Certainly for our shut-ins, Janet Brissett, Phyllis Eddy, Duane and Phyllis Cook, Ivy Lawrence, Shirley Parrish, Artie Richards, Shirley Storm, Lee Wilson, Don Woodard, Jack Fawcett, Doreen Fenton, Helen Porter, Bill Stinson, and Pete Wilt. And for all those who are recovering from COVID, I will reiterate also that uh, uh, please give uh, Diane time to heal before we start bothering her. I know she wouldn't say it's a bother, but uh, for those who have COVID, they need to get better. And for those with cancer, Ann Voss, Chip Curran, Natalie Jones, John Curry, Kathy McAndrew, and uh, Kinsley, Danny Monk's niece, who is five years old. We come now to the prayer of intercession. May we pray together. God of love and liberation, We give thanks for the stories of our faith in which you fed Israel in the wilderness and Jesus fed the hungry crowds that followed him. Like them, we sometimes forget to be grateful for what we have and are consumed by complaining about what we do not have. Like them, we sometimes grab more than our daily bread. So help us to take only what we need and live the rest for those who are hungry. Forgive us when we follow Jesus 
or pray to you, only seeking after our own good. Help us to pray for higher things, for the things that will equip us for the work of ministry and to perform the works of God. Holy One, we pray for this community, for its families, its individuals, its children. We pray for the nations of the earth that the world may know plenty and peace. We pray for those who hunger for bread and for those who hunger for righteousness, that they will be fed with what they need. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be the bread of the world, giver of life. Give us this bread always. Amen and amen. Join me now as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Amen. Stand as we sing, Spirit of the Living God. here with today's children's sermon and we're camping in Inverness Florida with the youth group today we're going to talk about camping has anyone there been camping before tell me what it's like when I think about camping I think of sleeping bags bonfires and looking up at the stars and bringing lots and lots of stuff what items do you guys think of if I could only bring one item with me it would probably be matches so I can start a fire no wait water so I have something safe to drink Oh, and a sleeping bag and a blanket so I don't get cold. But wait, I forgot marshmallows. S'mores are the best part of going camping. But what would, what good would that be without the matches to start the fire? Okay, let me try this one more time. If I could only bring one thing with me for a long camping trip, it would be a sleeping bag with built-in pockets that could store my matches, water bottles, and marshmallows. Oh, and a flashlight, and a chair, and a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, do you think that counts as just one thing? Yeah, I don't think so. This is so hard. I don't want to give up any of those things. You know, I read in, a, in the Bible about Jesus going out into the wilderness one time. He stayed there for a full 40 days. That is my long camping trip. What do you think he brought with him on this trip? Do you want to know the answer? Nothing. Seriously, nothing. As in, no sleeping bags, no water bottles, not even a marshmallow. Jesus went out into the wilderness to prepare himself. He was about to choose his disciples and travel all over preaching the good news of salvation. He knew just how important this was. So Jesus wanted to make sure there weren't any distractions. Just Jesus and God talking to each other. No food, no drinks, no friends, no distractions. Have you ever tried to talk to God and been distracted? 
Maybe you hear your favorite TV show is about to start, or you can't stop eating your milk and cookies. There might be toys to play with, friends to talk to, or a happy dog just needing a belly rub. It all can get very distracting, and the next thing you know, it's an hour later, and all you've said is, Dear God! It just happens to all of us, but thankfully Jesus shows us just what to do. We need to go into the wilderness and bring nothing with us. Now I don't mean actual wilderness, I just mean somewhere that we can be alone with God and have no distractions. Maybe it's sitting at the dinner table, kneeling by your bed, or even plopped on, a top of, on top of a pile of dirty laundry in the laundry room. As long as it's somewhere that you can be alone with God and away from distractions, you can also try saying your prayers out loud to cover up any noise around you. You could turn your prayer into a song or a poem or making a list of things to pray about so you don't get distracted and forget anything. But the most important thing is to remember that God just wants to hear from you. No matter if your prayer is long or short, fancy or simple, silly or serious, from inside of a church or from under your bed, God just wants to hear from you. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for our friends and family. Thank you for our teachers and pastors. Thank you for our doctors and nurses. Please watch over those that are sick and hurt and help them find relief in you. Please watch over us. Keep us safe and healthy in making the right choices to come back to church or our computer screens next week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bye, everybody. We love you. Anxious words. For our walk in this world, they resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life, words of hope. They give us strength. In this world, wherever we roam, ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with all.
with open heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Oh, let the ancient words Well, I'm tangled up here, so we'll just do what we can. The text for the sermon today obviously is not what Diane had planned when the pastor called me earlier in the week and asked if I could be available to uh, share the message today. Uh, I asked him if he wanted me to try to follow along with what the lectionary was doing or, or to do something else. He said, do whatever I wanted to do. And since it was late in the week already, I thought about where I was and what we were looking at, and this, uh, this sermon came to mind. If uh, you turn your text in the New American Standard Bible, which is different than what we normally read, to John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, story that we all know, story we all can share, it begins in... Uh, verse 2 with, on the third day there was, uh, excuse me, the verse 1, on the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Mother of Jesus was there. Both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water parts set there for the Jewish custom of purification containing 20 or 30 gallons each. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. And when the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, every man serves the good wine first. And when the people have drunk freely, then he sees the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of his signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Do me a favor, will you? I want each of you to close your eyes. And I want you to envision in that darkness of your closed eyes the face of your spouse or the face of your significant other. Maybe it's a daughter, maybe it's a son. Somebody in family. Just hold that for a moment. Imagine that face. Okay. It is 10 years later. Solomon and Sarah Steinway of 33 Carpenters Row, Cana. Solly built a fair trade for a small town. Sarah takes care of their two children, eight-year-old Deborah and four-year-old Joshua, who's already a handful. And they have a nice house, and they have nice neighbors, and they're active in the local synagogue, and they're loved by the family, and they're respected in town. And today, today is their anniversary, 10 years after that wedding. But somehow they don't feel like celebrating. You see, 
the wine has run out again. And this time, it seems like it's for good. There's an empty feeling there. Yesterday, Sharon and I celebrated our 39th wedding anniversary. And we had to put our cat down that day. Talk about an empty feeling. Talk about feeling like the wine ran out. What a wedding they had, though they didn't realize it at the time. Everybody told them about it later. Aunt Mary, not his real aunt, but closer in some ways, because Solly, his dad Chiam, was a colleague and best friend of Joseph since their apprenticeship days. Well, she, Mary, asks if her boy, Jesus, and a few of his friends can come to the wedding. <laughs> yeah, what can you say? It's Aunt Mary after all. Okay, let them come. First time they've seen her since Uncle Joseph passed. And these fellows turn out to be a fun bunch of guys. The only problem is there's 13 of them and they drink like all the wine is available for them. They drink like fish. They drink like camels who've been in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. And the wedding coordinator, he sees it coming before anybody else, and he goes in and he whispers to Chiam, groom's guide, or groom's father. And Chiam leans over and whispers to Solly's mom, Esther, who goes over, seeks out Aunt Mary, and whispers to her. Now Mary, she storms from the table like a mercenary on a mission with the wedding coordinator in tow. Nobody's mentioned it to the bride and groom, of course. They can't be worrying because this is their special day. It's not going to be spoiled by some embarrassment. It's not going to be spoiled by some quarreling. Besides, each of them are too enraptured with each other to notice anyway. So Mary finds Jesus and his buds around back in the shop where they're swapping fish stories and hoisting a chalice. And Jesus is telling them the one about the fisherman who used shekels for bait when Mary bursts in on them like Romans on a raid and interrupts Jesus in mid-sentence. What do you people think this is? Your personal tavern? You guys drank all the wine. There's not a drop left. You've humiliated me in front of my friends and ruined these dear children's wedding. Busted. The guys, embarrassed, suddenly notice what their sandals look like. And tiny Mary cowers these big lugs to silence. Except Jesus. Jesus says, quit hounding me, woman. What do you expect me to do about it, for heaven's sake? I can imagine that finger goes to his chest. You know, she answers. Mother, please, I'm not ready, he says. But his mom glares at him with that look that all moms possess and that you would recognize. At that moment, the wedding coordinator who, by the way, looks a lot like Barney Fife, uncomfortable, wanting to be excused, <coughs> clears, his, <coughs> clears his throat. And Mary turns like a tiger about to pounce on him and tells this guy, do whatever he tells you, as she points over her shoulder with her thumb to Jesus, who's standing there shaking his head, and then she walks out without even looking back. Jesus... Size. You got any water? Hey, I need some water. Well, this guy says, 
Well, we got those big jars of holy water over there under the ladders, but they're reserved for the Sabbath. Top them off, Jesus says. And so the wedding coordinator sings six guys, takes maybe 20 minutes, and all the time that they're doing that, Chiam, groom's husband, or groom's father, Esther, groom's mother, and Mary keep interrupting people who want to make another toast to the couple, and the wedding coordinator keeps pushing the kosher canopies to the guests to stall their request for more wine. All done, says the servants. Fill this up and take it to your boss. Well, first clue, Sally and Sarah have that something's going on. The wedding coordinator is running into the room. Remember who he looks like. He's laughing and he's shouting, It's a miracle! It's a miracle! It's a miracle! But that was 10 years ago. And lots happened since. Poor Aunt Mary's, Aunt Mary's boy got crosswise with the council down in Jerusalem and paid with it for his life. Some people say he rose again and lives in their hearts. In fact, those people started a whole movement that's stirring up in the synagogues. And the Romans have come down hard on the people of the late, and lots of folks in these parts are talking revolution, which will only make the Romans come down even harder. Sally and Sarah just try to mind their own business and stay out of trouble. But they are in trouble because the wine has run out for them again. Oh, literally. They put what was left of that great wine Jesus made into some skins and they stored it. And every year, on their anniversary, they took some out to celebrate and remember their day. That wedding that everybody talked about for years. And what a day it was. Everybody was so happy they forgot all their troubles, at least for a while. At least for a while. But the wine wouldn't last forever. You see, they finished it off last year. And the wine has run out for them in other ways. Two, the wine of kindness, the wine of compassion, the wine of passion, the wine of tenderness, the wine of love. The wine's run out, and so has the joy. Life is hard. In the day, Today, work of getting the business going and raising two kids, they just sort of forgot each other. It's not that they feel any kind of hostility. They just don't feel much of anything. But jump out of your skin when you see each other. Feeling is gone and they don't know how to get it back. And so tonight, they put those two lovely children to bed and sit down at the table to remember with longing how they felt on that day and what Mary's boy did for them. And for a long time, they sit in painful silence as if they're miles from each other, which in a sense, they are, not knowing what to say, but feeling at least they owe it to one another to be honest and not to pretend anymore. It's a long silence. Breaking the silence, Sally says, I wish we had some more of that wine. It was the best that I ever tasted. But Sarah doesn't answer. She just nods her head and there's more silence.
You know, says Sarah, maybe it wasn't the wine that made the party so much fun. Maybe it was him being there, laughing, including everybody. Do you remember how he did that? He didn't make himself the center of attention. In fact, we didn't even know he was there most of the time, and I'm sure he listened more than he talked, but there was something about him. He was so relaxed as if every person he saw was the most important person in the world, and he brought people together, and they felt that way. He did not look past them. He looked at them and with them. If he really saw you, made you feel like you were important, stood there smiling as if what he loved best was enjoying people, enjoying each other. I can understand why people believe that he's alive in their hearts. I think the miracle of the wedding wasn't what Jesus did for us with the wine, but who he was. And that he was here with us. And I so wish he were here tonight to tell us what to do. Sally says, you know, Rabbi Shalom told us the other day that we're always looking for the Holy One to do things for us. If the signs of the Spirit among us were big blessings and large rescues, but the rabbi said the signs of the Spirit are smaller but greater than the spectacular things we want to see. Like people being kind to one another. Like people loving one another, forgiving one another. Little things we do to help each other, things like that. Things few people notice but things that really make life worth living. We take them for granted because the Holy One is so generous in handing them out to all of us if we'll just accept them. But those are the signs that the Creator is still with us and which gave us the courage to do the right things for the Holy One. And with a pained face, he said, and for each other. Sally, Sarah says, do you think the Spirit of the Blessed One is with us now the way we knew the Spirit was with us when Jesus turned water into wine? Could His Spirit turn our memories into our future? Do you think the Spirit can get us back to where we were 10 years ago? I don't know, Sarah. I don't know. I'd like to think it was still possible. What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? You see, over and over again, we come to this table. Jesus gave this table. And he said, keep remembering it. Keep remembering it. What on earth do you think he was saying? It's not just the bread and the cup that we're supposed to remember. It's how to behave toward each other and treat each other. Remember what people said about them? Oh, how they loved each other. That's what this is about. On the night he was betrayed, He took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. 
And he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Hear the remember. Hear the remember. And then he took a cup and he poured it. And when he poured it out, he said, this is the new covenant of my blood poured out for you, showing them how he loved them. Remember? Do you remember? And if we do, the charge is that we will continue to remember even with those people that we saw with our eyes closed. I sing a song of the saints of God standing as we sing. we share a cup and as we share bread. We ask, O oh Father, that you would help us again to remember how we are to live together, how we are to treat each other, and maybe it is that we can find a way to behave more like you. In the name of our Lord Jesus, amen and amen. Amen.